Hey everybody, I'm Amanda with DevExpress and welcome to today's webinar using DevExpress MVVM Magic with WPF presented by DevExpress technical evangelist Don Wibier. In today's session, Don introduces you to a very cool MVVM framework which ships with our WPF controls. You'll get an overview about what MVVM is all about, plus how our framework can help you implement this design pattern to deliver state-of-the-art WPF desktop applications. FYI, this session is being recorded and it will be made available on our DevExpress YouTube channel. We will also do a live Q&A at the end of this presentation. Just type your questions in the GoToWebinar control panel at any time throughout the broadcast. All right, thank you so much for joining us. I will now hand things over to Don. Thanks, Amanda, and uh, welcome, everybody. Well, as Amanda already mentioned, I am in this webinar, I'm going to introduce you with the core principles of MVVM. Um, I will touch a bit of MVVM, so you'll have an understanding of what it does. Um, and I'm going to show you this awesome, cool framework that we have. So, let me uh, start with uh, what is MVVM and why. Um, well, MVVM stands for Model View, View Model, and yeah, it is a design pattern which uh, enforces you a couple of things in your application architecture to make your application more maintainable by separating the UI from the data persistence through a view model. And the way that this basically works um, is you have your data access layer, so that would be like the most right one with which says model, and that can be something which is built with Entity Framework or our own XPO or Direct SQL with stored procs or web services or a combination of different things. And the view model is reading out that information uh, and it will compose it in a way that it is presentable for the end user. Also, if updates needs to be done, uh, the view model will communicate with your data access layer uh, and the view, so the UI does not have any knowledge on how that goes under the hood. And that is basically one of the things that what the view does. I mean the most optimal way of the MVVM based application is that a view will use two-way data binding with the view model. So the view model will expose properties or certain uh, commands which can be used in the view um, and, and that will be bound to controls inside the UI. Also an important aspect is change notification. So whenever something changes on the view, the view model is aware of that because of that binding mechanism. And well, that is a very cool aspect because that means that you can develop or you can code your presentation logic in the view model and you don't need to do all kinds of quirky little things in the UI. So for instance if you have a text box which should be enabled if you tick a checkbox, that is presentation logic and that can be developed and, and coded in the view model and you'll see a bit later how that works and yeah, how we can maintain a clear UI so the presentation layer. Another thing, because the, this view model is not aware of the view which is bound to this particular view model. So another nice side effect of this application architecture basically is that we can just remove the view and we can do a unit test which will test several things on the view model because the view model doesn't know anything about UI um, and all the logic concerning specific UI related things are in the view model, you can write unit tests to test your view model, which is a nice side effect of this um, design pattern. So for all of you already doing MVVM development, uh, there might be a question like why did we develop this framework? I mean there are a couple of frameworks out there and there are Pretty, pretty good and, and pretty uh, familiar in WPF land, so why? Well, 
if you would use a WPF, if you would build a WPF application, like a vanilla WPF application just with the Microsoft stuff which comes with Visual Studio, there are a couple of complicated aspects like services and behaviors are a couple of things which are also implemented in MVVM and what this basically does is, let me get back to the first slide. Suppose the view causes something in the view model to change and the view model needs to give the user a confirmation like are you sure you want to delete something or whatsoever. The view model should not directly interfere in the UI and for that the view model can acquire a so-called service um, and it allows uh, the view model to propagate certain UI related things like a or a dialogue or whatsoever uh, to be shown uh, in the view basically and well if you would have that with vanilla WPF it would be a bit of work to implement um, something like that well we have that out of the box and it's really really easy to use because of, of all those those, uh, those goodies packed in that framework, you will have less code in your view models, which means that it is easier for you to maintain. You don't have to check all the massive amounts of code because that is already done by us. So you'll have quicker results in the end as well. And yeah, the last thing, and you'll see that in a minute, we have some awesome design time support, which is just too cool and it will I mean, all of our WPF controls have uh, knowledge of the MVVM framework, so it will all be available through all our WPF controls, which is a really, really nice feature. So, yeah, let's uh, let's do a bit of coding um, and show some some of this magic. So, I'm going to set up a small, really small application, and I'll introduce you with a couple of main basic aspects of the framework um, because there is like a lot of stuff involved in the entire framework it's just impossible to do it like the whole framework in in, in, an, in an hour so I'm gonna show you a couple of, of nice features uh, which will give you an impression on how much time it can save you all right so let me create a new application by using the DevExpress template gallery. It will just be an empty solution, but because I use the template gallery, let me select WPF blank application, I will be having all the references set up correctly. We'll have a main window, which basically doesn't do a lot. Uh, before we continue, let me make sure that the startup location of this main window is on the correct screen. I am having a multi-monitor config here and it would be a bit of a shame to show this monitor, uh, this application on the wrong monitor all the time. So with this in place we can drag in two other files. I will create a folder which I will be calling data. And what I have prepared here are two files basically. One of them is a track info class. So I'll drag that in here. And this is basically a snapshot taken out of the Chinook database, which holds a collection of music tracks together with albums and artists, etc. You can get this database for free from CodePlex to test a bit with uh, a normalized database, basically. And for this webinar, I included a track list. Let me put it in data as well. And this is basically a collection with a preloaded set of tracks. So we have some data to work with. Um, with this in place, I'll do a quick build. So I'm sure everything is set up correctly and we can start using the first design time feature for the WPF MVVM framework. 
I'll right click the solution and I'm going to say add a new dev express item and in this case you'll get a couple of features that you could add and I am primarily interested in the view and the view model section in this case I will be adding a track view and as you can see a view model class is being generated as soon as I hit add item I can choose the poker view model or I can choose the regular view model and um, well I think the most interesting part is the poco view model because poco stands for plain old CLR object and that means that this view model class is not derived from any base class which comes with the framework or it's not depending on, on, on any stuff and this is also a great way to show you how magical this framework is basically so let me add the item and what you see is that a couple of folders are being created in the solution one with views and one with view models what we immediately see is that there is an invalid markup and that has to do with the fact that I need to rebuild the application because the view is unable at this stage to locate the view model which is uh, you where the view is bound to so what we see now is that everything is is working properly um, and let me start by introducing a couple of things in the view model so as I mentioned the view model is used or basically the view is bound to the view model the view model doesn't care what is bound to it but it will just expose certain behavior and certain properties and so on and if the view is facilitating those it, it will work out of the box but this framework has a couple of things to be um, aware of and that is suppose we want to edit this track object I'm going to introduce a property and that is one of the things which comes with the framework uh, we have to make sure that the property is made virtual so I'm going to make a public virtual track info object it's it has a normal get and set nothing particular and um, and another thing is that we do not want this track view model to be instantiated by code by putting a new track view model um, statement somewhere we want this track view model to be created through a factory which is inside the framework so I'm gonna hide the constructor by making it a protected constructor and I'll get some data some random entity well in this case the 15th element out of the list um, which is assigned to the track so we have some test data and as I mentioned I want this track view model to be generated through the factory of the framework so for that it is necessary and this is all convention based it is necessary to create a static method which is called create and what we see here is that the view model source is the factory class it has a method create which expects a lambda expression which allows us to create this new track view model and because this code is being executed inside this class we can still instantiate this protected constructor so this is just a a, a small thing which is absolutely necessary for this uh, MVVM magic to, to work so with this in place we have set up a very basic view model and if I now build the application again we can bind a couple of editors to this particular view model and for that I'll switch back to the track view and I can now change the grid I mean you can use whatever you like but I'm going to use a stacked panel for layouting 
and I will put in a couple of text editors here. So let me open up the toolbox and make sure that I have the 60.1 text edit. Here we are. And let me put two more in there. And now I'll be able to bind the text property to something which comes from the track view model. In this case, I will be binding it to track ID. The second one, I will be binding to the name of the album, or the name of the track, basically. And the last editor, I will bind that to the composer. Now what you already see is that we have design time data and that is obviously because I created in memories uh, an in-memory data store so this will work design time as well. To have this view loaded we can switch to the main window.xaml add a namespace here which uh, allows us to um, link in any views which are in the solution. So this is going to be 12.views. And I can now add a view which is named track view. Well, if I now run the application, it will probably not be a surprise that we have this window including this particular track from ECDC. Well, so far, I haven't been like much magic. Well, there is a bit of magic going on, but we're going to extend it because this is just general binding functionality, which comes with the vanilla WPF as well. But let's make it a bit more interesting. Suppose I want to have a button on this on this control or on this view which allows me to clear the name of the track so the second text box but this button should only be enabled if there is any text in that control to be cleared if that particular control already has some data in there the box sh the button should be disabled well, I can hear you all think like, okay, so we're going to do a couple of events here and there. We're going to check the value of that box. But no, we don't want to do that because we want to have all the UI logics built into the view model. So let's start with that. Let me close the application and get back to the view model like this. What I'll do now is I will implement some code here, which has a specific purpose. I will create a public Boolean method, which is named can reset name. And this is basically a constraint or a check whether the name property can be reset. And it can only be reset if there is a track object assigned to this view model and if the track name property is not empty. And as I mentioned before, it is convention based. So I'm going to implement another method which actually clears the name property of the track. And do note that I have a public boolean method which starts with can and then something behind it and I have a method which has the same portion here you see and this is where we start doing some cool stuff because what I can do now is let me quickly rebuild the application and now let's get back to the view And what I'll do here is I'll implement a uh, tool panel 
which is also from the dev express control set so that would be a toolbar control and okay so now I put it on the bottom but let me put it on top to make it a bit more prettier and what I'll do here is I'll add an item it's gonna be a bar button item and if I now select the bar button item I can change the caption to clear name and what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna bind a command because if I click this button something should happen and in the normal or like in the non MVVM way we would like double click this thing and code in an event but we don't want to do that we don't want to have any code in the view so I'm gonna bind this and what you see here is very interesting because there is a reset name command and if you remember I implemented a method reset name and this is where the magic begins because the framework has already created a command for this particular method and not only that let me just hit this OK button and run the application what you'll see is some other behavior on the UI as well and I did not do a lot for it if I clear down this box and I will move to the next control you will see that the button has already been disabled so there is one thing that I don't like on this particular behavior and that is as soon as this editor is empty I want that state of the button to be updated now it will only be updated once we leave the editor so the actual property has been changed but we can change that fairly simple if I just close down the application and I'll go to the text box I can change some properties on the binding so let me open up the binding dialog again and I'll put the binding back on track.name but what I'll do now is as you can see the update source trigger is default which is on last focus which is what we just saw if I now change it over to property changed and hit OK if I now run the application you'll see that it does exactly what I want and that is if I clear this box by using the backspace key as soon as it gets empty the state of the button gets updated if I start typing again the button is enabled again so this is where it gets interesting because this behavior is coded in the view model by implementing this method so a public method in the view model will be transformed into a command which is important to remember and I put a constraint on it as well the can reset name so whenever that reset command can be executed um, that will be automatically be updated through the particular controls so I'd say this is fairly simple to implement and you'll have yeah a whole bunch of events and checks what you normally would have done replaced by just this simple piece of code all right but let's let's take it a step further I was mentioning before that there are things like surfaces and um, behaviors so what can we do with that in this in this simple demo well as I mentioned also the view model class is not allowed according to the MVVM design pattern to communicate directly with the UI um, so let me give you an example suppose if I hit that reset name button I want a confirmation I want to have a dialogue which states are you sure you want to clear it and that would be in initiated from the view model but again the view model shouldn't be dealing directly with UI related tasks so for that 
we can implement a so-called service which allows us to post a service message through to the UI and it will still allow us to generate that confirmation. So we can do that by using the following approach. I'm going to implement a property and check what's happening here. It's going to be a protected virtual. So it's going to be virtual again because we're going to add some flavor and some spice to it at runtime through the factory. And you can even see that it returns nothing. The property just needs to breathe here. And it's of a type iMessageBox service, which comes from the framework. I have also decorated the service property attribute on this property and that determines how to locate any existing service which might already be there to improve the performance of the application. In this case, it al I'm allowing it to search through parents of this view model as well. Um, and you can read quite a bit more about it on our documentation. Um, and next I can do a small change because I have implemented this message box service property I can now make a small change here as I mentioned I can now pop that message up on the surface by uh, calling the show message method which comes with the message box service and well the show message parameters look pretty familiar probably so I'll now show this confirmation box and if we click yes, the track name will be cleared. But before we can actually run the application to test this, we need to implement this behavior on the view. And the view should be aware of the fact that this message box service might be used or in, yeah, might be used from the, from the view model. So let me switch back to the track view and select the control. And here I can use one of the other nice design time features which come with the MVVM framework. I can now switch over. So I can also go to the service link and what you'll see here is there is this DX message box service. And by implementing it just like this, if I close this one down and look at the XAML code, you will see that this is basically the only decora declaration which is added to the XAML. And this means that this view model is able, or this view is able to deal with the message box surface. And with this in place, let me run the application again. And if I now hit this button, will have the confirmation. Are you sure you want to reset? So what basically happened on the background is that I pushed this particular behavior back to the UI. And once I click that button, this confirmation will show up. So if I now hit no, it will be what it was. If I click yes, it will be cleared. And as you can see, the clear name button is also disabled because it was empty. So we have done some of the UI logic, but all coded in the view model. And the view only has a number of bindings to the view model. Let's take it a step further. And let me introduce another view, which will hold a list of all the tracks available. So I can now right click add a new dev express item i want to have the view and the view model and this is going to be the track list view together with the track list view model so here it is again yeah at the first stage uh, it is unable to locate that uh, that track list view model so let me build it and we'll get some stuff in the designer. So once that is done, uh, it should update 
pretty quickly. Here we are. And I can use one of the other features that comes with the WPF controls of DevExpress. I can now use this uh, functionality to quickly add a grid because I want to show a list with tracks. I want to have it as a table view. And in a matter of seconds, we'll be having the grid available. We do need to change a couple of things in the view model class as well. So let me do that first by adding a number of things here. And I'll be adding a couple of things which shouldn't be a big surprise. I will add a virtual property, which is an instance of the track list. So it will have all the tracks. That's our data in this case. Uh, as I mentioned before, I will hide any public constructor by putting in a protected constructor. And I will create this static create method, which allows us to create or instantiate this uh, view model through the factory of the framework. With this in place, if I quickly rebuild, I can assign the grid that I already put on the view model or on the view. Let me switch over here and I can bind the item source collection to the tracks property of the view model. So here we have the tracks, as you can see, because it was in memory data, we already have data available. Um, I'm going to disable the allow editing because we're going to make it a bit more interesting slightly later. I will now change the main window markup to make sure that this will be the startup view being loaded. So I can now change this to track list view. And with this in place, if I run the application, we'll have a grid containing all the tracks. So all very nice. What I want to change now is that if I double click any of those items, I want to have that an, an editor to be shown, which will contain the track view which we developed earlier, which will be used to edit any of those entities. So for that, I will need to do a couple of things. I need to code in something which if I double click the, uh, an item on the grid, something should happen. And we will not be using code behind to code in on that double click event, but we'll use it like the MVVM way. So we need to double click. We need on the double click event basically to execute a command on the view model. So let me first, and there is another thing that we need to do um, because we are going to show something from within the view model. So the view model will initiate something which will show the editor dialog, which will hold the other view. So well, what we have done before, we need to change something or we need to add something to the track list view model, which I will be doing now. I will implement the iDocument Manager Service property, which is something that we have done in the other view as well for the confirmation dialog. So again, I'm just going to implement that property and I will return nothing because that will be handled uh, runtime and I'm going to implement a command or basically a method which will be transformed into a command 
which is called edit track. And that edit track can be as simple as the following. What you see here is we are passing in a track object. And this is a generic object, so we'll cast it over to a track info object. And we're going to acquire, we're going to create a document. And this will actually be this, this window that we will be creating. It's called a document, basically, where we will load in the track view with a new instance of the track view model uh, where we pass in the currently selected track but if you remember this track view model and you also see it in code um, that create method doesn't allow us to pass in any parameters so how are we going to do that well it's not too difficult because we can just add like an extra constructor and we can add a second create method, which will get that track as a parameter. So for that, we need to go to the view model of the track. And we need to add this extra functionality right here. So for that to happen, I will now implement this extra protected constructor. We don't want to have this instantiated somewhere in code. And I will actually check if this is, uh, uh, if this track is being set to something useful. And I will also call a method load. I'll code that in and we're gonna use that a bit later. And we can also rewrite this method to be a bit more optimum. I can change this over by calling the, the other constructor that I just created, which is basically the same. Well, as I mentioned, we also need to create an extra static create method which will accept a parameter. And this is one of the cool things as well, because the framework will determine if there is one of those create methods, which will have this parameter and it will pass it uh, right onto the correct method. So with this in place, there is only one thing that I need to code in and let me do that straight away. And that is, I will create that load method. And I could also assign uh, the track thing to uh, uh, directly, but let's do it through this method because I will be expanding this a bit later. And it's gonna have a track info track. And in this case, I will be assigning this dot track with this one being passed. In. And with this in place, I only made a couple of smaller changes to the track view model. And it is now enabling me to pass on, in this case, the selected track from the grid. So before we can use this, again, we need to make sure that the document surface is available on the view of the track list. So if I switch back to the track list view, I need to add that behavior section here. Um, and that is being done by making sure that we have the control selected. I go to the little wheel and I'm gonna add the window document UI surface. What you see here is that this is also being added to the control and um, I do want to set a couple of extra things here. So let me expand this and put a couple of things in here. 
and that is I want to open that window with some specific dimensions so I can just expand this and put this code in and it means that if the target is a DX window which will be the case because we're using that document service uh, it will set the properties width and height you could also set the title or more stuff but in this case I want to have the width and the height set to 300 pixels so we are now able to show that document that was created in the view model there is one other thing that we need to do and that is we need to yeah trigger that double click event we need to map that to a particular command and that can be done by expanding this here and what I'll do here is something which comes with the framework as well and that is a so-called event to command section let me paste it in uh, and this is one of the things that you cannot do through the designer you cannot select this table view so I'm gonna paste it in but it will probably be pretty clear what it does I will uh, map the double click event on the grid and I will bind it to the edit track command and the edit track command causes the edit track method which we coded in to be executed there is one thing before this all starts to work I mean the current item is one of the parameters in the in the uh, in the original event handler and it is based on the grid the element name grid but before this is gonna work I need to assign a name to the grid which will be grid and well what we have now is that if a double click event happens on the grid we'll be binding that to the edit track method in the end and the edit track method was coded in here it will come down to this particular place so if I now build the application we'll have this grid let me make it a bit bigger and if I now double click this we'll have a pop-up window which allows us to edit this particular entity and if I now start change this you will see one thing which might not be desirable and that is that the entity in the grid is also updated directly and that is because they're actually pointing to the same physical object and and this might not be desirable well I guess it's not you do want to have like a confirmation button and a cancel button to undo your actions in case of an error but what does work which is pretty funny is if I hit this button are you sh this behavior still works if I do yes the button is disabled as well so I made a couple of minor changes here and there and we are now having like a full application with a pop-up in uh, as well as a grid but yeah let me make some more changes that we will have this confirmation or this cancellation what you prefer um, before this is being posted back in the actual data store so I'll close the application and besides this behavior that we want to change there is also one other thing which I uh, which is a reason to change this anyway because what we see in the track view model is that we are binding directly to properties of this data object we are binding directly if I move down to properties of this data object and that is something that we don't want to happen in an MVVM application so this is where the 
the power of the view model comes in because this also allows me to hide certain properties that I will not be using or I can transform properties in the view model to be perfectly suited for the UI at that particular stage. So what I will do is I will introduce a couple of properties on the view model and I will be binding those editors to those properties instead. So let me go to this track view model and I will start by changing this into a lower cap property. And I will make this private. So everything is now being updated thanks to Code Rush. Um, and I now have this private virtual track. Uh, I can also remove the virtual class, obviously, because it's private. And what I will now introduce is a number of properties which I will be using in my UI. So let me get down here. And these are just the virtual properties because that's a convention of the framework. It's got the track ID, the name and the composer, just simple get sets. And I can also expand the load method. And this explains why I was creating the load method in the first place to update those properties. And to make this work out of the box straight away, I can go back to the view and change the bindings here because the track doesn't exist anymore. So I can now directly bind them to the properties on the view model. So I have separated the data object from the UI by introducing those properties. Well, I also want to continue by using this uh, OK and cancel button behavior. So to do so, I'm going to implement a particular interface on this view model. And this is just a standard interface which comes with the .NET framework. And that is the iEditable object. As you can see, it's coming from the system.component model. So I'm going to implement that interface and I'm going to implement it explicitly. And the reason that I'm going to implement this explicitly is because the methods begin at it, end at it, and cancel at it. I don't want them to appear as commands on the view model. Because if I would create a public method, that would be transformed in, in a command. So, and I don't want that to happen. So I'm going to implement this interface explicitly. And this makes sure that they will not show up as commands in my view. With this in place, we can uh, code those particular um, uh, methods and they are pretty straightforward. I mean, with the begin edit, I'm not going to do anything here. So I can just remove this one. With the end edit, I'm going to do a bit of coding because if the end edit occurs, the properties of the view model need to be copied in into the properties of the data object, but only if they have been changed. So if nothing has been changed, nothing needs to be copied over. So that would look a bit like this. Just checking and copying over if necessary. If the edit would be canceled, everything should be reverted back. So I can just call the load method and pass in the original data object, which was already as a private uh, member available in the view model. And now, I want to have those, those buttons which do the save and the revert. So I'm going to implement a method which is called 
public void save. And I'm going to do a public void revert. And to not have any duplicate code, I can just call the end edit here. And I can use the cancel edit here. And because I explicitly implemented the interface, I need to cast the object uh, which is doing all this stuff. I need to explicitly cast it over to an iEditable object or those methods are not to be found. So I now have implemented this editing functionality and I separated the UI modifications and stuff by introducing those properties and I keep track of the original object. Let me just add an E to make the revert look like a revert. Um, the last thing I can do now is after a quick build, I can add a number of buttons to the UI. So I can go to the track view and I am going to add a number of buttons here to this wrench and add a bar button item and add another one. This button will be the save button. which will be bound to the save command. And the other button will be the cancel one. And that one will be bound to the revert command. And with this in place, we are able to run the application and we'll have uh, a grid with a separate pop-up which allows us to edit the data. So here is our main window. Let me make it slightly bigger. If I go to this particular record, I'll have it here. And if I now start changing it, you'll see that the, the underlying grid is not being updated. If I hit cancel, it will be restored to the original value. If I do the clear name one, this behavior still works because we didn't change any of those. Uh, if I do cancel, it will be referred. And if I pick any of the other ones, if I hit save, you'll see it's being updated. And now I did clear this one, which was not the brightest idea. If I hit save, it is being updated in the grid. And with this demo, I hope that you will get a good impression on the power that is being provided by our MVVM framework, and it will take care of quite a lot of things under the hood um, yeah, by using this approach. Amanda, um, are there any questions? Here's a question from Matt. Is this the same framework the scaffolding wizards are built on? Yes, this is uh, actually, um, we have the, the, the scaffolding framework and uh, yeah, again, there was not enough time to go into that particular area, but uh, if you're interested, we can do something, uh, we can do a webinar on that particular area as well. We have some, some scaffolding based on an, uh, an existing database and it will compose an application which is based on this framework and it will take away uh, quite a bunch of, uh, of coding more for you basically, yeah. Um, how, let's see, let's see, from Stefan, what in your opinion would be a best approach to validate the data in the MVVM pattern? Well, 
I think uh, the best way would be to um, perform that uh, through the view model. I mean, uh, a lot. Of, obviously, the editors will have validation rules um, with them, uh, but all the logic behind it, like if you have conditional validation on particular editors, yeah, that should be taken care of in the view model. Basically, that's where all your pro, uh, your UI logic is coded, basically. Um, can we get the source code of this example? Yeah, obviously. I will make sure that it works uh, before putting it up. I'll, uh, I'll put a blog post on, uh, it will probably be on there uh, tomorrow, and I'll put a uh, link with the source code as well. Uh, so you can play around with it. It, does, it only needs the DevExpress uh, version installed. Uh, what about the unit test? Could we possibly have a quick example? Uh, at this stage, I uh, am unable because I don't have a working version right now. Um, it All might right be there. interesting. It might be interesting to uh, maybe do a webinar on the unit testing on this particular uh, area. But uh, uh, yeah, drop me a mail with your question about it, and we we might put a webinar together about that. Can you explain the purpose of the virtual property? Yes. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay, so I was mentioning it is one of the things that is necessary to use this uh, MVVM magic, basically. The property needs to be virtual because what happens if we instantiate a um, if we instantiate a new view model through this uh, factory, we what we actually do is we create a descendant class from this particular class and we add extra methods and uh, extra stuff to this to that derived uh, view model and that is something which allows us to add commands and all that kind of stuff in the way that we are doing it right now so we will add in quite a bunch of stuff which makes all the magic happens and if you wouldn't make that property virtual, we couldn't do a lot with it in the derived classes. So that's the reason why you have to make them virtual, and you have to hide your constructor, and you have to use this construction to create a new instance of this particular view model. Uh, to set the data context, should it be possible or is it possible to set it programmatically? Um, it, should be, uh, it should be possible to set it uh, programmatically, but um, yeah, in this case we are using this to give you all the design time features, so I'm not entirely sure if that would work, uh, if then the design time features would all work if you would set it programmatically. I guess it does, but... Okay. Um, let's see. Um, is there an example of having a tree object in MVVM? Uh, that is a good question. Um, like a directory list. Sure. If we have any on the demo uh, on the demos uh, section, let me have a quick check because um, we obviously have our sample applications, but not all of them are set up with this MVVM framework. But uh, let me see if there is a demo of the of a tree. How we do of a tree map. I'm not sure if we have that demo, but um, yeah, if you want to know more, please uh, drop me an email and I'll see if I can come up with a small demo for you. That's not, not a big deal. Um, and then, let's see, uh, well, here's a loaded question. As a WinForms developer, do you recommend changing the WPF from Pedro? 
Yeah, that is a uh, <laughs> obviously a uh, a very tricky question. I mean, it, it depends on on like it, it depends on on your needs. I mean, if you have like an application which you're working on for like the last ten years and it's like massive and it's like incredibly big and complex, I wouldn't even bother changing over. But I mean. If you would create like a new application and you want to take advantage of like a scalable rendering engine and you want to take advantage of some newer features like MVVM uh, is something which is pretty difficult to achieve in, in, in wind farms. Yeah, then it might make sense to switch over. And I mean our controls are as well available for wind farms and WPF. So if you use our controls, you're already on your half half on your way basically. Yeah. Uh, but again I wouldn't I couldn't give you a straight answer like yes, do or no, don't. <laughs> it depends on your situation. Sure. The team is saying, yeah, you can use practically the same techniques for our wind forms controls. That is true because we do have a similar library for wind forms, but I will not go too far into that right now. Um, from Torben, other MVVM frameworks use an IOC container. Is there any IOC container involved in this framework? Uh, there are some uh, some links available. Well, for instance, uh, one of the very uh, very famous uh, MVVM frameworks is uh, Windsor Castle, and um, uh, I forgot the name of the other one. But we. Uh, you can you can still those kind of uh, libraries together with our with our MVVM, uh, especially the the Poco uh, view model um, uh, technology. And I will put up a couple of links about uh, some some use cases which are using IOC containers together with uh, with our MVVM framework. Uh, Lawrence asked. Is there a way to create these members dynamically, like reset name and can reset name? Is there a pattern or just reflection? Uh, that is a good question, which I cannot answer right now. I uh, I have to get back on that. Please drop me an email, and I'll I'll get back to you about it. Um, and then let's, let's see, yeah, we're out of time, we'll ask this one, well, Amit asks, uh, in one line, what's the major difference between MVC and MVVM? Yeah, that is the, uh, that is the extra view model uh, class, basically. I mean, model view controller is a controller, you've got a view, and the controller puts some data in that uh, view, and vice versa. MVVM has like this extra view model which has all the logic inside it and it is it, it looks a bit similar or it looks pretty much the same but this is like a step further in separating concerns and stuff. All right. Cool. That's it. All right. Perfect. Thank you, Don. You're welcome. All right, everybody. You can check out devexpress.com slash webinars to see recordings of all of our most recent webinars and to keep up to date on upcoming sessions. And like I mentioned previously, today's webinar will also be available on our DevExpress YouTube channel. The link is posted in the chat box. And that is it for this one. Thank you so much to Don. Thank you all for joining us. And of course, Thank you for choosing DevExpress. Bye-bye.